Hi, this is Peter Schiff. This Friday, uh, May 15th, 2009. Well, we got some economic data today that once again is, uh, is being misunderstood by, by the media. Uh, first of all, uh, we got information on consumer confidence, and apparently consumers are somewhat more confident in the economy today than they were the last time the data was released, which mainly just goes to show you how little understanding average consumers have of the U.S. economy. But the whole focus of consumer confidence is misplaced in the first place. I mean, first of all, the fact that consumers are getting more confident is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, some kinds false confidence could get you into trouble. Like if you falsely believe that the ice is sound, then you go skating, and then you end up falling in, uh, you got into trouble because you were confident when you shouldn't have been. And I think that's the case with consumer confidence. And one of the reasons that a lot of economists look at it is they want consumers to be confident so they'll go out and spend more money, so they'll go deeper into debt. But that's exactly what we don't want them to do. We want them to have the good sense to save for the future to stop going into debt, to stop borrowing and to stop spending. So to that extent, the fact that if we can have falling consumer confidence, if that's what it takes to force responsible behavior on American consumers, then less confidence would be more desirable than more confidence. You know, also, we got the CPI numbers today that came out flat. And year over year, which is going over the you know, preceding 12 months, uh, consumer prices, according to the government, dropped by 7 tenths of 1% which is the biggest annual decline in consumer prices in, I don't know, since the mid-1950s. Now, some people are saying, hey, this is evidence of deflation. The Fed needs to create more money. We need to save us from deflation. This is all nonsense. I mean, first of all, the fact that consumer prices are only down seven-tenths of a percent during the biggest economic decline since the Great Depression shows you how much inflation is actually underlying this economy. Falling prices are what we need. In fact, Falling prices are the one thing that's helping out in this downturn. Uh, we need prices to come down, particularly asset prices like real estate. Falling prices are not the problem. They're part of the solution. Unfortunately, the government is not going to allow the solution. The government's going to print a lot of money, and so we're going to deal with rising prices. Eventually, asset prices will rise, but they'll rise far more slowly than consumer good prices. So Americans will be growing poorer even as their financial assets are, are rising in terms of dollars. You know, also, I wanted to make a comment on Barack Obama's speech that he gave at Arizona State University. And, you know, once again, his speech is filled with half-truths or where he partially gets it right. I mean, for part of his speech, he talked about the fact that America became a great country uh, because we saved our money, because we invested wisely, because we produced things, and, and all that was true. Uh, but Barack Obama's policies are, are advocating the reverse or preventing the structural reforms that Barack Obama himself admits needs to take place from happening. He's trying to encourage more reckless borrowing and spending. He's trying to get Americans back into the malls, back into the car showrooms. He's interfering with the free market's attempts to restructure the American economy along the lines uh, of the past that he's now praising were the reasons that we're so uh, wealthy. And I think one of the reasons that Barack Obama seems to misunderstand this can be revealed in some of his other comments. For example, he encouraged graduates uh, not to seek profits, uh, but to work for nonprofit organizations, and that there's more important things in life uh, than, than making a profit. And it shows me, I think, a lack of understanding of basic free market principles, which is something that is typical uh, for people of this mentality, people who are the intellectuals, people who uh, you know think they know more than everybody else, this was a type of mentality that was common, you know, in in, in Russia before the, the the Marxist revolution. This idea uh, that the market doesn't know as much as individuals, and that there's something inherently evil or wrong with pursuing profits. What we know from real economics, from Adam Smith and the Invisible Hand, is that seeking profits is the best way that individuals go about increasing everybody's standard of living. Because the way you make a profit is to produce a product or provide a service more competitively than other people. And everybody is better off. The problem is that recently, people were seeking profits because of government interference in the economy. They were gambling with cheap money supplied to them by the Federal Reserve. Or they were acting on improper, improper signals being sent to them by the government. 
and that they were taking excessive risk and speculating because the government interfered with normal free market forces that would have tempered that activity. So the fact that Barack Obama is criticizing profit seeking and the idea of going out to try to make a profit and somehow elevating you know, altruism and doing good and charitable work over that, again, shows a lack of understanding of, real, of, of, real, of where real wealth comes from. I'm not against a charitable giving. I have nothing against people working for nonprofit organizations. But we don't want to say that that is what we need to do to make the country great and that we don't want to focus on, on profit seeking and individual and increasing our own wealth. Because no, the reason America became so wealthy is because many people tried to increase their own wealth. And the way they did that was by increasing the standard of living and wealth of everybody else. That's precisely what, uh, what um, Adam Smith was writing about when he wrote about the invisible hand. But what, what Barack Obama wants to do is replace the heavy hand of the state for the uh, invisible hand of the market because he thinks he knows better how to guide it. He thinks he knows uh, the industries that we need, what types of innovation we need. Of course, he doesn't know anything. If he did, he would be out there doing it in, in, in the private sector, profiting from his insight. Instead, because he has no real insight, he goes into government, and now he's trying to force his, his agenda on the rest of the country. The last thing I want to talk about is a little bit more about decoupling and what's been going on. Um, you know, if you look at what's been happening in the stock markets, we've had this rather substantial rise in U.S. stock prices from the lows. <clears throat> of course, we've had a much more substantial rise in foreign stock prices and an even more substantial rise in the shares of gold stocks. Now, in the last week or so, we've seen a bit of a correction from this bull move uh, in, in the markets. What's interesting is that foreign stocks during this small decline have held up better than domestic stocks, as have the gold stocks. And it's some indication that perhaps not only uh, might foreign stocks continue to outperform U.S. stocks on the upside, but we might not be far from the point where foreign stocks and gold stocks can continue to rise even though U.S. stocks resume their de descent. And I think that is definitely going to happen at some point in the future. And maybe what we're seeing now is signs that it's already beginning. Because remember, the, the world has a much smaller problem to deal with than America. The problem for the rest of the world is simply one of reallocating their productive capacity. Now that America is broke, the world needs to retool its factories and, and change its distribution methods. They have to go from producing for us to producing for themselves. And, and so there's some changes there in, in, in the way products are distributed and in the, the composition of what products are produced. But the bottom line is they still have the infrastructure, they still have the machines and the tools, and they still have the savings. So transition, that transition is easier to make. It's certainly problematic in the short term, but it's, it's much easier compared to what we confront. Because in America, what we have to do is now we have to figure out how to convert all of our malls and shopping centers into factories. We have to figure out how to make stuff for ourselves now that we can't import it from everybody else. And we have to rebuild our own savings now that the rest of the world isn't going to be providing us with their savings. This is a much more difficult transition to make because fundamentally our economy is flawed. The world's economy is not flawed. And this is a much more painful transition. And unfortunately, the solving these problems is being made progressively harder by what the government is doing in the name of solving them. Sure, foreign governments are making similar mistakes. They're just making them on smaller levels. But they're making similar mistakes in fundamentally sounder economies that will, that will be able to withstand them and ultimately overcome them. But the United States is making these mistakes in a fundamentally unsound economy that cannot stand uh, what the government is doing. So instead of having a, a recovery, our recession or depression is simply going to get worse and worse, and ultimately the rest of the world will recover, and we will see this decoupling if it hasn't already begun, as evidenced by recent action in the market. Anyway, uh, that's it for today. Everybody have a great weekend. I'll be back again next week.